Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good morning. 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 So I feel like I brought the Florida weather to New Jersey. It's going to be in the 80s or 70s. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, today's, today's session is going to focus on KPIs and KPMs. Anybody uh, have any KPMs that you're looking at to drive your business? Maybe maybe the lack of this will emphasize the importance of today's session. Um, anybody, you know what KPIs are? Key performance indicators and then key performance metrics? All right, somebody doesn't know. There you do. You know now, Bridget. So they're basically the levers that that drive the production. Okay, or the measures that have the levers that drive the production. Um, what do you think? Well, anyway, let me let me backstep and say, as we look at what our KPIs and KPMs are going to be, it starts with the end in mind. Like, what's the desired outcome that we want? And it may seem like a really obvious question, but you know, if I asked you know everybody on this call or this Zoom meeting, I bet you would have very various different responses. Some people might say, "I want to make." Platinum, Chairman's Club, Circle of Excellence. Other people might define it by saying, you know, I want to save up money for uh, buying an investment property or my first house. Other people might say, you know, I want to be able to manage my my calendar and have a, a higher quality of life. All of those things are very relevant and important things. But if you ever tried to, you know, drive somewhere without a GPS or a map, you kind of, you know, just wander and meander and key performance indicators and metrics are the things that help keep you on course. Um, and I think in terms of uh, looking at it from a measurement standpoint, I think the desired outcome, you know, how are we going to assess our progress during the process to get to the outcome? Um, how can you control? Um, how can you control the outcome? Um, who's responsible for the desired outcome? And this is more, um, that's a little bit more for team leaders and people who have leveraged themselves. Um, how will you conclude that you have achieved or missed your outcome? And how often should you measure the process along the way? Um, so those are, those are some of the, the measures or the metrics that even if we're a independent salesperson, I think that having an awareness and a focus on it and knowing that what gets measured improves, right? If anybody's tried to lose some weight, you know, what do you have to measure how you're doing? Your scale. You have a scale, right? And that scale is brutally honest, right? Yes. You step on it, it tells you whether you're doing well or not, and it doesn't accept any excuses. It says you ate too much, you didn't exercise enough, um, you're failing, or you're doing great. You know, the numbers are going down. Um, so are the things that uh, I think we should be, you know, measuring are going to be appointments or customer acquisition is kind of the top of the funnel. You know, what does it cost for us to acquire a customer? Um, and in often terms, they refer to it as CAC, customer acquisition cost. Anyone know what your CAC is? Anybody want to volunteer? I do not. I'm sorry. I don't, Rob. I'm sorry. You don't know yours. Hang on. Let me see. I can I can tell you a stat that's interesting across the board for our gang. The metric is down 50% from a year ago. So we have a certain thing when, when we track running a credit or certain thing for somebody, we would normally run 50%, maybe 70%, not of what we close. We close 98% of it, but that number right now is 25% because there's no inventory because people decide to do different things. So the, the number, the scalability of how many people you have to talk to has gone up dramatically. We were just talking about that yesterday. I'm having a little, can, can you hear me, Bruce? Yes, sir. All right, good. I fixed my uh, challenge. So um, again, just like the scale is a leveler, um, you know, everybody has to play in the same market. So the, the field is level and um, you know, customer acquisition costs can be in a few different ways. Um, you could spend money to acquire customers. Um, you can have uh, repeat business. You can spend time to nurture new relationships. And that new relationship nurturing could be, you know, calling people that you don't know, could be 
tapping into your sphere and your past clients or your clients, you know, customer satisfaction and retention, you know, also uh, lowers the cost to acquire a customer if you have customers that are coming back. And then um, here's something that I think a lot of agents and and even you know business owners um, don't always manage enough, which is you know revenue and costs, right? Because um, I've seen people in the business, this business and other businesses that have tremendous revenue streams. That we call that the top line, and they don't manage their expenses. And I'm sure Bruce, you've seen that in the mortgage business. And when when you have a big top line and the market you know, the, the market constricts, that's a recipe for disaster, right? Not only can you not make as much money, but you can quickly turn to negative. So in our industry, we need to manage the cost, uh, the revenue cost expense or the profit margin. You know, are you spending 20% to get a dollar, 20 cents, or are you spending five cents or 80 cents to get a dollar? Okay. So you're, Profit margin or your uh, cost to revenue expense or revenue divided by cost expense would be your profit margin. And then there's another there's another number, which is net income. And I think from most of us on this call, we might want to look at net income as net income after all of our mandatory expenses. So if it costs us four thousand dollars to pay our bills, Okay, if we're not hitting four thousand dollars, we're going in a deficit, right? Maybe that four thousand is not invested all in your business, but that's your that's your cash flow that you have in the business. So if we take the time to actually painfully write these numbers out and uh, engineer the process, it, it will encourage um, it will lead us to measuring the metrics or the levers that drive the business so that we can have the outcome that we want. Um, I'm just trying to, let's see here. If there's anybody that, so I, I see, uh, I see Lisa's on the, Lisa's on the phone. So if you want Lisa Malservice, if you wanted to you know, drive more business, what are some of the things that you can do? Um, Lisa, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're, oh, oh, I'm here. Sorry. I, I was trying to unmute. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Well, I would, uh, I would uh, start making more phone calls, go door knocking, do activities to create business, like maybe farmer's market, to meet more new people, activities, different activities that would drive business. Great. So, so those are, those are um, you're generally activities that aren't uh, having a direct expense. It's not like you're doing a mailing and hoping that the calls come in, right? So those are things like making phone calls. Um, do you know um, or do you have an idea, Lisa, of what an hour or 10 hours of calling could yield you? I do not. And now, um, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, um, but if you think it would be good and helpful if maybe you tracked it and you could figure out every every week, if you make two hours of, of calls a day, you're going to have three appointments. And of those three appointments, Two of them stick, and one of them equals a piece of business in the next ninety days. Yes, absolutely, it would help to track it because then, when you see the results on paper, you're more likely to do it because you've seen the results. You know, it, it, can I jump in here real quick? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, because um, I I I have classes on this all the time with my agents, and um, we. We call my son and I. We call. We have the dialer, and we probably call what three hundred a day, at least three hundred a day, and maybe get three leads, uh, not appointments, but three decent leads that that will eventually lead into an appointment if we follow up. So it's a little tougher today uh, when you're calling. Now we do cold calls. We haven't done too many expires. Or FISBAs. We've done a few of those, but um, we're getting in more into that. But when you're cold calling, you're going to have to call a whole lot of people to get. And this took what? How many? Five days? What's that? How many? We, how many days did we worked this week? Four days calling. So we did four days of, of, of cold calling, and got uh, 
maybe I, six. On Monday, I did over a thousand calls for like eight hours straight. I didn't talk. I talked to maybe fifteen people. That's another thing to having conversations yeah. per you know uh, when we do the call quality. So we probably got like six leads in one one week, which is good. That will lead into appointments. You know, Rob. Here's here's another sort of interesting uh, look at it. Um, I had the occasion to, I got into an Uber um, in Las Vegas last week, and the driver had a spreadsheet up on his uh, tablet. And I asked him, what, what's the, sweat, the spreadsheet about? And he says, well, I keep track of all the hours I drive so that I can see what are the most profitable hours by day um, of the week so that I can plan the days that I'm going to be most active out and driving uh, to get the, the greatest return on my time. And, and, and if you don't measure it, he has no idea, right? Exactly. And, and Robert, if, you, if an Uber driver is going to measure that, right? Mm -hmm. We almost, it should almost be a requirement in our business model that we measure the activities mm -hmm. because um for example if i paid you uh robert uh 450 dollars to make two hours worth of calls in the morning and i paid you 30 dollars to show houses in the afternoon and you only wanted to work four hours a day and you only wanted to work you know three hours a day what would you be doing i'd be making phone calls You'd be making those phone calls, correct? So, um, if it's good for an Uber driver, um, it should be a necessity for us. And if there's anybody on this, if there's anybody here that feels a little bit of the market compression, um, you know, the market conditions. I mean, we could we could write a story about why things are tough. How interest rates are up, inventory still low. We can tell ourselves this disempowering story, or we can look at what the market numbers are. But the only thing that really matters is what, Robert? Your story. Perseverance. Right. But I mean, if, if you're making 20% more than you did last year, does it really matter if the market's off to you personally? No. No. And if you've built systems and you measure it, um, and you feel confident that, you know, not only are you going to maintain that 20% growth, but you're going to grow 20% on top of that. Um, does, the, does the inventory or the interest rates really have an impact on you personally? No. So that's, that's what I'm trying to drive at. The, at the, the uh, measuring and the metrics are, you know, many of us work very, very hard. Um, sometimes we're not working as smart as we can, and it's not a reflection on our intellect. It's a reflection on, you know, what draws our attention and what do we focus on? And if we're focusing on activities that aren't going to give us the biggest return, um, I think that's a, that's a tremendous mistake. And, and it's incredible that that Uber driver was trying to measure you know, he's probably also measuring, hey, if I start my routes over at the east side of town versus the north side of town, I get more profitable calls. Or maybe if I'm on the strip, there's a lot of traffic on Friday. So to complete the routes, I'm not making enough money. I mean, that's amazing that, you know, he's doing that. And most of us, you know, I would say the majority of the people in this industry, Robert, don't measure and understand what activities are yielding them what result would you agree and you'll be happy to know that when i saw this guy's spreadsheet i thought of you <laughs> you know yeah. the thing is is that you know a lot of a lot a lot right now yeah. is that um the, the market's very challenging so we're finding that we have to make probably yeah. five more 10 times more calls to get more uh more out of it so uh when we when we call we try to we try to call for two hours, but sometimes Ryan's on the phone for four to get maybe one appointment or get one or two leads. So it's it takes a lot more time than it did before. So you have to kind of plan for it. And I was telling the agents if you prospect 
two hours a day, that's 10 hours a week, you're bound to get one appointment or at least one good lead, but you got to continually do it. And that's calling FISBOs, expires, and cold calling. And then door knocking is another six hours a week. So you got to plan that into your schedule. That, and that's how you measure what you uh, what you get out of it. Uh, and and you know, Ron, I, I would I'm going to give you this uh, pivot, and it's only because words matter. And, and you know, we've talked about you know words and how they make us feel. Um, and instead of challenging, um, let's replace that with the market's dynamic, right? Because it's changing, and uh, a changing market is also a dynamic market. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. And and I think it has a more positive connotation to it because if if I go to work and I'm making calls and I say the market's challenging, um, that is that in my opinion it's like and starting out with a negative right and you know you're being completely honest but if we keep telling ourselves the market's challenging you know maybe the market's changing maybe the market's dynamic um and in changing environments what comes with change like if i said hey you know what it's been the same for a while everybody has been in their place now the market is getting shook up it's changing what does change represent to some of us? What would you what would you throw out? Opportunity. Exactly. So so with a changing market, there's opportunity, right? And the opportunity goes to those people who both measure, shift, pivot, right? Um, you know, we all have guesses, right? And I've had guesses. I'm like, you know, in this market, I'm gonna guess this. Sometimes you guess wrong, and if you're not measuring it, then you're going to go down the road too far before you realize maybe you, you made a wrong turn. But in dynamic markets, there are abundant opportunities instead of challenging markets have low inventory. Hey, Rob, Glenn Baker put up a, a, a good comment um, in the chat, um, huh? which really follows with this. Um he says, we use a dashboard and activities to track the activities. Once you start tracking, suddenly you see patterns. It can't be casual. I'd like to add to that, Rob. I, I think, and this is just my observation here. You know, I think that you're, what I found in our business, and I know like for a guy like Glenn, it's really, the metric is impossible if you don't have the activity. And, you know, I think some of the people that have all the activity, it's habit. You know, it's habit of things that they know every day are going to be proven to, to you know, whether it's, you know, calling center of influence, expired, FISBOs, past clients, just listed, sign ads, whatever, it, whatever that is, and learning what kind of language to have. That's how you'll get the, I don't think, I don't think the metrics can really happen unless you just track the activities. You just have to track the activities and then to, to, to Glenn's point, then you'll see. But, but I think the activities are really where the focus should be if somebody already doesn't have a, a set of activities they do. Yeah, I agree. So Rob, you know, X number of activities, doesn't matter what you do is going to produce X number of outcome. And, but if you don't measure it, everyone tricks themselves into thinking they did it. So, oh, I door knocked today. I did an hour. Well, you did 25 mm -hmm. houses, right? If I do 200 and commit to doing that that day and don't convince myself that I did more, uh, then you say, okay, I got one out of 200. So I know I need to do 200 if I want this outcome. If you're not operating like that, I, I don't know how you treat it like it's a business, right? Yeah, I agree. And, and as we talked about it on Monday, um, in your class on Monday, uh, schedules are so important. And if you don't write it and follow your schedule, uh, you're just not going to be able to accomplish what you want to uh, get out of your uh, business. You have to follow the schedule. You have to, you know, control it and be able to uh, follow it day by day. So it's like Glenn said, if you do, 10 doors, 25 doors, what are you, what are you going to get out of it? Probably nothing. You know, you have to get, you have to get more involved in your prospecting today than you did two years ago, three years ago. And it's just the way it is. I don't care how you spin it off. You know, you can spin it off as dynamic. You can spin it off as challenging. You have to work if you don't. And that's what I keep telling the agents. You got to work. It, it takes time and it takes effort. So, so Ron, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little deeper on that because sometimes 
work just means activities. It doesn't mean productive activities. It doesn't mean measured, intentional, productive activities. Um, why do you think a lot of people go into real estate, Ron? <laughs> flexible. Well, a lot of them think that they can make money doing it. Right. But, flexible hours, nonsense. And, 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 you know, flexible hours. I want to have the freedom to not have a nine to five job, right? Yeah. But that paradox is is the nail of death, right? In real estate, hundred percent. So, so it, it's the grand paradox of real estate, which is I'm coming in here because I have flexibility. Um, I don't know any successful agent that's worth um, hiring that works less than a a forty hour a week jo uh, job. You know, like if you were to work as a nine to five job or maybe you know whatever the schedule is i think that we put in more time and i think that the successful people have just found a way to structure the time and measure the results from the different investments in time that they make you know it's it's nothing it's nothing different than hey if you're going to invest your your hard-earned money you know are you going to put that hard-earned money into a um a checking account with interest are you going to put it into a certificate of deposit, or you're going to put it into a, um, a, uh, index fund, which over time is going to yield more money. And if you were to invest your money and not pay any attention to what the history was, wouldn't somebody call you the foolish investor? Right. I mean, nobody can guarantee that two hours of door knocking is going to equal a, uh, an appointment or, or, or anything. But over time, they can say it's very probable that this is going to yield this result. So if you invest 5000 a month into the S&P index, there's probably a really good history that that might be yielding you 6 or 7% over maybe 8% over time. But if you put it into your interest checking account, you might be getting 0.05%, which would be a really foolish bet. So we should measure our our investment in what we do, which is far more important and far more um, uh, has far more impact than uh, you know even a few percentage points on our financial investments. This is this is how we add value and earn income in our profession. So That's why I think it's important that the activities are diverse too. It shouldn't just be door knocking. It shouldn't just be you know, it's all about context. It's all about connection. And, and you know, that's why, and you guys have tons of literature that I've picked up in your offices and we have our own too. Just, just having, you know, this, this wider net that you're, that you're casting out of different activities so you could get that metric. And, you know, you may be weak in certain areas and then you learn how to get a little better in terms of language or what to say, but there may be some areas you really excel at. So it's, I, I think having a, a wide range of activities helps you figure that out. Especially like, for example, who the hell wanted to be in the stock market over the past three days? Nobody. Yeah. So we all got diversified a little bit. Luckily, some are in bonds, some are in. Exactly. Um, yeah, and and you know, it's it's not, you know, it's not just a you know beat you over the head, and make phone calls, door knock, do whatever it is. But it's to, you know, and Bruce, your your team, you know, they need to be not just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. They need to not just be making calls. Just like everybody else, we need to do relationships. You know, we need to diversify, call past clients. Um, you know, as a as a lender, um, you know, tremendous value might be, hey, you know, you give your preferred agent, your best referral source, one or two buyers that you call the people that you know looking to buy. They work with an agent that's giving you business and you have that that synergy that just grows the whole relationship right and and it's not by accident it's not hey i happen to run into them at you know uh, a halloween event and they said they were moving it's hey you know what i'm reaching out i'm actively seeing how i can help people right yeah, we, we you know we also you know part of the activities when we really get on it which we are now because obviously we all are increasing activities if we're not we're gonna have a problem because our, you know, our activities are getting half the results that we're getting a year ago, because of the more, you know, the interest rate environment, because of, you know, less inventory, all this different stuff. But so part of our whole thing is really just connections with people on the phone. It could be either a great phone call, and some people say, well, "What's a great phone call?" A great phone call is any phone call where you get to talk to somebody about business and ask for business. And it's not really a great phone call by definition, but we're tracking 
greatness in terms of activity. So once we have those phone calls, we know there's a metric that'll show. The other thing for us is face to face is huge. So, you know, for us, we try to tell everybody, look, you got to get 15 faces to face with people each week. You know, each week you have to get 15 face to faces with, with people you're trying to do business with. And then five of those 15 face to face should be a break bread. You know, whether it's a cup of coffee, the dynamic changes. I mean, Glenn Baker, you know, I was in Marstown recently. There was this video of him doing this whole thing. It was really cool. That guy who's really makes a really cool video, the guy with the drone and stuff. And, you know, he was somewhere in a fire department. It looked like, really the kind of guy you want to talk to. You know, Glenn, just call Glenn. It's about the engagement. And to me, you know, tracking the kind of activities of, that's a way to scale it, right? But tracking that activity, <laughs> tracking who's checking stuff out. We, uh, we just do massive activities. We try to have it more just be contacts with people. And then we know that contacts will lead to different things because we know what to say when we get the contact. So. And Bruce, you brought something really, um, something struck me when you just mentioned that. And I know we talk a lot about, hey, doing cool video, doing this, doing that. Part of success is also knowing what you are and what you're not. And when you measure what you're doing, um, you know, Glenn's formula is not going to be the same as Lisa's or Paul's or uh, Mark's. Everybody's going to have a different success formula. You know, their, their comfort level, their natural ability is going to be different. And the only way you know that is if you measure it, right? You know, like a great athlete, you know, they might be great at basketball and somebody else might be great at hockey. OK, you take that hockey player and you have him play basketball, it might not be a, a really good outcome. So measuring these activities, OK, and, you know, having a, having a plan to understand what's happening is the foundation. OK, and there are people that despite Ron's training, despite my training, they're never going to be good at cold calling and some may never be good at door knocking, but chances are, if you're not great at one, you might be better at another. And, and you if the metric to... gives you the opportunity to get better too, though, Rob. Like if you have 60 connections, we try to have 60 great phone calls a week with people or 60, at least speak to at least 60 people. If you don't know how to do that, then then that's then that's how you learn. You, know, you got to get your, you got to talk to people that it is more comfortable because even if you don't like cold calling, you, you, you know, to me, it shows an area where, you know, where you can improve. You find out the right language. You find out what to say. It's not as complicated as people make it out to be. People yeah. love to talk about themselves. So ask them about them. They'll start flapping their gums. Forget it. You won't be able to get them off the phone. And I don't mean that in, in an unendearing way. It's great if you have a good connection, but there's so many ways you can, you can be trained or you could learn how to get dialogue going. It's just, uh, you know, to your point, it's your fear. It's, you know, what holds you back, what holds whatever. And uh, I would, I would challenge over and over and over again, if you feel more comfortable with what to say, you'll always you'll always feel more comfortable making those calls. You, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's like uh, it, when you're when you're calling people uh, and you're asking them if they want to sell or they, you know, they want to buy, sell or invest, whatever, and they say no, and if you, you know, they hang up on you, that's not considered a contact. That's not considered a conversation. It's when you actually have a conversation with someone. So if, when Ryan calls sometimes and I go, well, why didn't you in involve yourself into a conversation he was she was trying to open up dialogue and you know he gets on a roll he just wants to he just wants a yes from somebody so when he doesn't get a yes he doesn't engage in conversation so when somebody has a conversation with you or ask you about the market that's the time when you need to really involve yourself into a conversation with them and maybe turn them around. And then they'll be more comfortable saying, hey, you know what, my sister or my cousin or my my friend next door or my neighbor wants to buy a house or sell a house. But to, when you're cold calling and when you're calling people on the phone, if you don't involve yourself into a conversation with them, it doesn't consider a lead. It doesn't consider a conversation. Move on to the next one. You can't count that. So you got to count yourself as five conversations per day. It's in our schedule, five days a week, Converse, five conversations a day. If you don't achieve it, you got to get back on the phones until you achieve it. So, Ron, let me ask you, you know what's good about this new market? So people will listen. <laughs> well, okay. Um, when you had good markets, right, where the, where the business was flowing, it created bad habits. Would you agree with me on that? Like, if you're successful by doing nothing, then you're like, oh, <laughs> I've arrived. I don't need to do anything. The The business falls in my lap, right? Then you then you forget the fundamentals exactly. that made you successful previously. Exactly. So I, I would write this down and maybe even, you know, for those of you who are visual, put it on your mirror in the morning when you brush your teeth. Good ha Good markets create bad habits, right? Ron, good markets create bad habits. 
Dy dynamic markets, we're going to use that instead of challenging. Dynamic markets require good habits. Good, good markets create bad habits. Dynamic markets require good habits. Okay, so if you go back to the fundamentals, okay, you will grow in this market. And, you know, there are many of us on this call that I'm seeing that are having years that are better than last year and the year before because they're focused on the activities that they're doing and the solutions that they provide. And um, I also, um, and I would encourage everybody on this call to find a way to um, anticipate and appreciate objections, right? Because the objections, most of us know what the objections are going to be, right? Oh, interest rates are high, this, that. Where am I going to go? We should anticipate and embrace those objections that are going to make us better. And in this market, it's also okay that some people, you know what, Ron, unfortunately, some people may not be able to afford to buy now in Southeast Florida or New Jersey or Virginia Beach because interest rates have gone up or they might have to change their, um, you know, change what they're looking to acquire. You know, they may have to say, hey, you know what, I need to buy a two family until I can afford a one family because the interest rates have gone up. Or if they don't want that, then they have to wait. But the only way that we get through all this is by having more conversations and not trying to force somebody to do something that that it's not the right it's not right for them now. And you know, if there were no objections and there were no problems, how do you think we would be compensated? Do you think we would get paid a commission? If there were no um, challenges and problems in real estate, no, right. We, and 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 if we were paid a commission, it would be really, really, really low, right? But because there are challenges, because the market's dynamic, because we have to focus on the value that we present to the market to complete transactions, um, we should be loving and anticipating and embracing objections and knowing exactly how we're going to address them. And I, I think it's important when you do an activity that you don't define. And I, by the way, I know you have all this at senior offices, but I have Mike Ferry stuff. I have the core stuff. If anybody needs daily activity trackers, just, just give me a call. I have it for real estate and mortgage. But um, one thing I, I think is real important is that when, you know, when you, when you, it's really just about the activity and I'm not to, to suggest that it's not a bad outcome, but you're, I can assure you one thing. If you're not doing the activity, there will be no outcome. So at the end of the day, just taking a little, I try to tell my gang, just taking a little bit of, when, you're, when your metric of, of accomplishing something is you did a certain amount of activity, it gives you a little more mental fortitude the next day with the habits and things to kind of stay at it again. Hey, I made my 60 quote, because you'll know when you made those calls, something will happen. It's really hard if you're basing it just on the outcome, because at the end of the day, the activities we all know lead to outcome. It's, it's just that simple. If you're not doing activities, nothing's going to happen. And, and if you're afraid to do it, and I don't mean that like in a literal sense, but if you're afraid you might screw it up or trip on yourself, you know, it, it, it's all well, well, experience. You know, you, if, if you, you know, Zig Ziglar had this, this thing once, it's, you know, if you're not willing to learn, nobody can help you. But if you're willing to learn, nobody can stop you. And it's just the reality of it. So if you don't know, ask somebody. There's people here that do a ton of business in this market. Ask them what they're doing. I mean, I know we love to share what we're doing. And I know a lot of you guys do too. You have your own groups on Fridays and Mondays to help each other. Don't be afraid. Just do something. Just do so, it. So, it. Yeah. so Bruce, like, you know, it, it's really interesting because my preparation for these meetings, you know, it, it kind of um, changes as we have these conversations, right? Because when Ron's saying, you know, the market is challenging, you know, sometimes this and that. I, I just know that there's a message in there. And, you know, the good markets really create bad habits. Right. And oh. then and, and then and then we, we, we don't pivot back to what like we think that we think that we created, you know, so we've been in the business three years. Let's say I'm I got in the business in 2019 and 21. I had a great year. Right. By, by being lazy and being off point. I think that, hey, wow, I, I, I must be a genius. You know, I'm doing all things right, but the business is falling in our lap and it's giving us false evidence that what we're doing is correct. Then but I also think when they throw that out, Rob, they're throwing out an opportunity for you to talk to him. If, Ron, if I'm calling Ron and I'm cold calling Ron, Ron says, yeah, it's a challenging market. And he wouldn't because he's a positive guy. But if, if it's a seller, yeah, it's a challenging market. 
validating, and this is just textbook sales 101, validating, you know, yeah, I, I know you feel a lot of people say, feel the same way, but we have found certain segments where, you know, people are really benefiting right now. And then, and you get that dialogue going. It's about learning how to pivot. The exact word you just said is to whatever, if someone gives you an objection, it's an opportunity to, and I'm not a big fan of telling somebody that the way they feel is not right because that's bullshit. Whatever you feel or believe is what's real to you. So it's more of a evolution to, to get dialogue going. But to me, I, I think when you just do the activities, you'll see so many people have these different things or different opinions. I've heard on these calls for years how, you know, somebody thought something and then, you know, the next thing you know, you're selling them a home. So I, I think it's opportunity, but I think it's about learning how to play it. And if you don't do the activity, you're not going to learn how to play it. It's as simple as that. I mean, and, and sometimes Bruce, um, it, I agree with you. You you, you don't want to um, minimize somebody's feelings, but a lot of times uh, there's like a herd mentality. And what I mean by that is, you know, everybody thought it was great to buy at a certain time. Now everybody thinks, oh, interest rates are high. It's a horrible time to buy. And what we need to do is we just need to educate people so they can make it based upon the facts, not based upon, you know, the rhetoric, right? And also point out if they're fortunate enough, one thing we're telling clients right now is say, yeah, it is a tough market. I'll tell you what, yeah. fortunately, you're in a situation where you got a great agent and you happen to have the liquidity and the ability to qualify. There's a lot of people not in that situation. So you buy the house now and you revisit the rate later because at the end of the day, when rates mm -hmm. are down, there's going to be more people and that's not bullshit. And that house is going to cost you a hell of a lot more than 200 a month for a year or two when you try to get back in the market later. So fortunately, and I'm being sincere, but I'm edifying them. You know, fortunately, you're in a really unique spot. You're a great buyer. Even though, yeah, it stinks. You want the rent payment to be 250 less a month. It's not, but fortunately you can handle that. And again, that's that opportunity to just become comfortable with language to, in my opinion, to help somebody feel more comfortable. And then I, I often say to them, I'm trying to sell you on buy. I'm just saying, you're very fortunate. Don't minimize how valuable that is. And they say, oh, you're right. And most people kind of, I, I know it, I know it sinks in with them. And I mean it sincerely. Because I have people that can't qualify anymore too. That extra 250 knocked them out. So the people that are fortunate, they need to know that. So Rob, just to bring it back to uh, the where the discussion sort of started with the measuring activities, um, Glenn had posted that he's happy to show an example of their activities tracking, um, which I think would be helpful for people to see um, if Glenn doesn't mind. Yeah, that, and, and that's you know, kind of the culture that Glenn has because Glenn spent a lot of time. And I want to just put this out there, Robert. Glenn spent an inordinate amount of time, you know, refining, uh, re-adjusting uh, all these activities and systems. And now he's out here saying, I'm willing to share it with the group. I just want to just call that out because, you know, all this effort, he's just willing to put out there. And if you're still there, Glenn, and you want to share it, that would be uh, amazing. Did you want me to, uh, if you want to give me share rights, I'll put it right up for you. I, I keep the dashboard up all day. So, um, yeah, you, uh, let's see. I know I want to see it. <laughs> and a couple of other people have mentioned in chat that they'd like to see it too. So. Me yeah, too. And, and, you know, Rob, one of the things that I, I always say to the team is that our mind is the greatest trickster. You'll always convince yourself you did the things that are necessary and you really didn't. Uh, because you you don't want to face the fact until you see it documented somewhere. So that's the the premise of why we use this this software. Um, and it's pretty simple. I'll, I'll give you the back. I got I have share access now, Rob. I'll, uh, yep. yep. So um, it's pretty simple that what we have on our phone an app at five o'clock. It reminds you at the end of the day. Well, <laughs> end of some days. My day is twenty hours, but for most, uh, you you ended uh, and you at five o'clock or whatever time you set you go in and enter your activities. So you record them on your phone. It's a really slick interface. On the computer, it's actually a little bit less of an interface. Um, but what this does is that once you log your activities, this records how many we have. And then we can go out and see, um, you know, a relationship between number of calls. Like we're not heavy callers. We don't do cold calls. Uh, we only do warm calls. We do a lot of video. I mean, I, I should say that. So we've done 34,000 dials, but they're all pretty much in some way, shape, form warm. <laughs> um, and and I, I, we just don't do cold calls. Uh, we're just going to start to do some expireds, but that isn't even going to be a phone call. So it's going to be tracked in a different way. Um, but we always try to take a different angle at it. And the, these, these are the metrics we measure. You can pick and choose what you want to do. So for instance, my daily huddle calls, you have to make four a week or you're not on the team. Simple as that. So, and other than vacation time. So the daily huddle calls, people log in. 
Uh, you notice that we have Rob's mastermind on our list. Uh, we require you to make three per month or you're not really going to be a part of the team either. Certain things are, are mandated. Office meetings, they have to make at least one a month if there is one. That's where the, the, some of this stuff falls a little bit apart because like if we don't have an office meeting, meaning a, a Remax office meeting, not our meeting, you got to rationalize those numbers because there's nothing to measure against because there wasn't one that month. And this system doesn't accommodate for that, but not, not a bad deal, so to speak. Um, and then you can use this activities or these activities to create challenges. So when people, I had a recent challenge where you had to do three different things and each of the activities was weighted. <laughs> and if whoever won did the most points, they got a free concert in the city and dinner with me at a steakhouse, right? But um, you suddenly can start to incent people and the leader dashboard will show them who's in who's in the leader leader's perspective and who isn't. But it's all based on them logging the activities. Um, and on Fridays, I have a 15 minute call with every single agent. And the 15 minute call, I strictly bring up the dashboard, say, here's what your goal was, here's what you did, what happened? Or how do I help? Like, what's the, you know, what, what was the cause? Some say I was sick, some of them say I have kids. I go, okay, so you notice down your target next week, you gotta like double up, right? Because the, the number is the number, it doesn't change. You, you, want, you have a goal, we know that you have to make 40 calls to get one appointment. And we just rationalize it that way. And our 15 minute call is very quick also, the 15 minute call is a 15 minute call. I schedule them back to back. So I put a timer up on the screen. So there's no BSing. If they didn't enter their numbers, I hop on the call and say, have a great week. Talk to you next week. I'm not wasting my time. Right. So, so, so Glenn, can you break this down per agent or per team member? Every single person. Yeah. This is so, yeah. So this, this, this is the overall view. And then you right. can drive down to every agent has their own dashboard. So, so, so these are weekly or is this monthly? This one is, um, the half year to this point. Half year. Yep. So, so I'm um, just curious when you talk about hours prospected, I would, I always argue that when you're showing a house or you're doing, that's not prospecting. That's the result of what you get from prospecting. Your hours prospecting is how do you define hours? It's not follow up calls. It's not, or is that also part of it? No, that's pure prospecting. So you'll right. see here, so Bruce, pure. that 932 nine here is showings. We don't give them credit for showing because that's a burden in hand. Um, I think that's where people get tripped up. They don't realize that too. You know, when you get busy and all these activities start, that's not prospecting. That's what you got from doing the prospecting. So you you separate that, it seems. Yeah, and, and we separate it. But also, I think an important aspect is even down to like you can see here, we have books read. Like enhancing your knowledge is a way to become an expert, right? So we we hold people to say, tell me how many books. Most people are at like a half a book a month on the team. Um, and then we we talk about it and, and see. Now, the only thing that steps out of band here is we do calls from Chime, um, which is for our warm leads. If someone's using Mojo, that reports out differently because it comes directly in from Mojo. So we don't track that. There, there's two different call sets. So you'll see number of dials here, and then you'll see the number of calls from Mojo. They're two different sets of dials, but collectively they're they're the calls. So um, oh, it's interesting to me if you add up the hours prospected and you divide it by because there's a few categories. If you add up the amount of hours prospected and you divide it by six months, pathetic. it shows you how. I mean, the results you get from just that little, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I know Glenn no. you do more prospecting. It's ridiculous to Ron's point. If you do two hours a day, his numbers would be off the chart. It's it, it literally prospecting is everything. All this came from it prospecting. Is. It is, and, and everyone undershoots it. And they all, at least they know it now, right? Everyone's way under what their goal was in terms of it. But we're talking about it regularly and beating it home. Um, Rob, you mentioned the thing about real estate, flexible hours. And I said, flexible hours. I just had an interview with another agent. And I said, it's super flexible. You can work 20 hours a day. That was my answer to him. Like, if you want to be, if you want real money, you got to work. Right, there's hours. <laughs> it's, it's literally not even an hour a day over six months that all those results came from prospecting. That's yep. freaky to me. Wait, but Glenn, Glenn, to me. Glenn I, I just did some quick math. Does this sound right? It's about 16 hours a week per team member prospecting. Yes, it's less. No, no, because no, it is, it's six months and, and you divide it by the uh, weeks and the team members. I came up with 16, oh, okay. 16 you're actually, hours. You're actually, um, I think if you aggregate the different categories, it'll be slightly higher than that. Rob, slightly higher. Okay, but so but about it, two hours a day. But but it, well, I mean, it's like Not three enough. hours, five days a week. So you know that to me, it, you're going to be a you're going to have a, a home run career if you can do three hours a day of prospecting. And if you define prospecting correctly, to your point, Bruce, like showing a house is not prospecting. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, I actually, um, I was talking to one of our uh, team leaders down in uh, in 
plantation and he told me that um he uses a service called showami <laughs> s-h-o-w-a-m-i yeah. to do his showings because that's just uh that's just a um an activity that's not generating revenue that's servicing the client so if the client wants to see it and he's busy or the client wants to see it and that's his prospecting time show whammy 40 bucks an hour 40 bucks a showing and his client gets served and he's still generating more business yep okay and this particular individual in this market personally goes on three listing appointments a week and he wants to get that number up to 10. So those are those are metrics that, you know, hey, if, if he falls short and does seven and he gets three out of that seven, he's going to be like on the leaderboard big time with our group here and amongst his peers. I want to mention one other thing, Glenn, is like, you know, this is the this is the gold standard of uh, accountability. OK, and when you have a team, it's really, really valuable if you commit to using it. But there are other ways that you can do this, um, which you, you might want to take a baby step before you do it. And and one might be um, for all the team leaders a while back, I did Google Sheets that you could send to your team members. You could set up a recurring email that goes out at five o'clock and they need to fill out the Google Sheet. And that Google Sheet will be able to do a graph to show them you know by day how many calls they're making. They can look at that over a period of six months and get a visual, okay? And you can track the calls to the uh, contracts written, the listings taken. All these activities can be done on a Google Sheet. Um, Fred Lopez and I created that that Google Sheet. The team leaders can um, have access to it, share it with the team members. Um, but Glenn, you'd probably be shocked to find out that most people didn't keep up with it. They don't, and that's that's why you know Rob, you know you you know I say accountability is love, and if there's nothing you give as a team leader other than accountability, uh, I don't know what you're doing, right? Like, cause, so the 15 minute calls at the end of the week, there's always a sob story. There's always something. Um, but your goal is to keep them on track towards what the number is and, and also just recording them as a challenge. Like, I'm not saying that any of this is easy because it's quite frankly, it's the most miserable part of everything I do, but what it does is it generates a different accountability. And I look at agents who join the team and they were between 1.7 and 2.5 million a year. And this year they're crossing seven and a half and 10 million due to the things, the activities that we're tracking, doing, talking about. Right. So, um, and all of my agents are less, I don't have an agent on the team that's in the business more than four and a half years. And, and Glenn, um, one really, really interesting uh, outcome of this was, is when you went to your team members and said, you know what, I care about you. We have a standard. If you can't do two transactions closed per quarter, you know, we need to send you to referral. Uh, you had some people that were very inconsistent that were doing two and three per quarter. Um, and I think it was because that expectation was set. Right. And before that, all we got was reasons why it, it couldn't happen. You know, oh, uh, you know, I sprained my ankle, you know, my dog, had, you know, whatever it was, all these excuses. But is that still the same that that that, that individual or, or those two people are still hitting the standard every time? Uh, close. One you missed last quarter, but yeah, and and you know they're the ones that always say, um, you know, I'm I'm a little sick today or something like that, and I'll go, that's cool. For some reason, I can't even see out of my left eye, but I'm on this call right now. Like I'll say, <laughs> I'll, I'll be like, so I, you know, it's sometimes you got to suck it up. You're your boss. Show up for yourself, right? You have to show up for yourself. I can't show up for you, and we and we talk about things like that. But it, the, you you. You have no measure. If you have no measurement, you can't hold anyone accountable. It's that simple. Like if you don't have a tracking of some sort, all you're talking about is the ethereal. You're not talking about facts, right? <laughs> yep. So if anybody wants the um, like the accountability Google link, um, come to come to this uh, same link at nine o'clock uh, or yeah nine o'clock on Monday or. I'll have Fred on. We'll um, give you a personalized Google link. Uh, I was interviewing a, um, a virtual assistant um, for one of our team leaders, and um, the person came from a uh, an agent in uh, somewhere in the Carolinas. The person retired, but they had actually, as a solo agent they had filled out a Google link at the end of every day to, to, so that they could track how their behaviors were, what their activities were over time. And there was nobody but themselves to look at it. So I'm like, you know what? You know, he would, he would have the 
virtual assistant putting the numbers up at the end of every week and show it to him because he wasn't technolo technologically inclined. But the assistant showed me, I would just show him this. Here's all the calls you made. Here's the appointments you made. And that's what the, that's what the salesperson wanted. And if an individual who's progressive enough to do, uh, to make that investment, have an assistant wants to measure those numbers, then as team leaders, we should care enough to measure that for our team members. And to be honest, if you can't fill out a link at the end of the day, it just shows me that you're not committed, okay? And, you know, for those of us who are parents, like, what would it take for you to, to not pick your kids up one day? <laughs> oh, I, I I left them at school. I forgot to pick them up today, right? You know, the authorities will come and take your kids away from you, right? Because that's that's an important thing to do. Now, is it not important to provide for your kids and your future and for your own mental well-being? Well, if doing that, is getting into a routine, having a system, and maybe filling out a link at the end of every day. Honestly, that's not micromanaging. That's showing that I care, right? 100%. And 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 if you can't, if you can't, and you can even open it up on your phone and you can fill it out like a little form. It takes, Glenn. How long did it take to fill out the form at the end of the day to report um, activities? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point, Rob. So that list looks daunting, right? And I don't want people to think each person, it's a master list for the team. And when they click it, they hit plus, plus, plus or number in and then go down, go down, go down and they close it out. It's maybe two minutes tops. And, um, you know, on, on the list are things that people prioritize. Like you'll notice we had 968 personal notes. They're important to the team. They're a part of your goals. I don't say I want you to make a million dollars. I reverse engineer it that a personal note equals X number of notes equals a transaction. That's how we do our business planning each year. We say you have to do these activities to get this number of transactions. And, and Glenn, when you say these things, right, they all, for me, they resonate. And Robert Garber, are you thinking Q? <laughs> when Glenn, right? Because yeah. Q, Q, Q has a system of having a certain number of points per day. And he knows if he has a certain number of points per day that he's going to hit his target. And by the way, Q was probably, you know, one of a very, very select group, if not one of the only that his first year at Remax, which wasn't even a full year, he made Chairman's Club with no real, no prior real estate experience. Then his second year, he made Diamond, which is a million dollars GCI. And you might be saying, well, he must be in Beverly Hills. But Robert, where was he? He's in the mountains of... Uh... He, he was in Mississippi, yeah. okay, one of the poorest counties in the country. His average sales price was one something. Yeah. Okay. So, so these things, Glenn, they, they just resonate. And it's not like it's owned by Q or it's owned by you or it's owned by the creator of Sisu. This is like just fundamentals that work, right? These are the plays that work. They and are. if you're a team leader and your team members um, don't see it important yeah. enough to fill out something that will help you manage their career, Maybe they're not the right people and maybe the tough conversation has to be had. And, you know, you wouldn't forget to pick up your kids. You know, you wouldn't forget to eat for two days, right? You don't forget to breathe. Like this is your, this is your career. This is what will help you um, have that consistency that a lot of us are fearful of. And this is the, okay. this is the value we have to provide as team leaders, right? Or people will depart. I had someone who I interviewed and they had said, now I know why no one leaves the team. They can't get that anywhere else, right? But it, it make no mistake, that tracking is the hardest thing you do. Like you, it's 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 brutal. I, I mean, I, I can't say it's the favorite part of my job, but I know it's a necessary part of it. And it's hours and hours of work keeping up with all the agents, making sure they're doing it. And on a personal level, if I did it, I don't know if I would do it without an accountability partner. So one of my recommendations would be, Find someone on this call that will face off with you if you don't have accountability partner and do it. Write him a check for twenty five hundred bucks and tell him if you don't do it, you're going to get they can cash the check. <laughs> That'll motivate and you. And if you like, if you like the business, like if you really like what you do, you you start to get a whole different energy about you when you do these activities. You get inspired. You start to see the results. It's like anything else. We go on a diet. We start to lose ten pounds. You know, pants are a little looser. It, it's like anything else. You know, the momentum that comes from. I keep going back to the habits that you know work. If you really like this business, you're gonna you're gonna get jacked. And uh, I think inspiration is something that's really 
hard to find in this market. So when you do activities, you could get inspired because you realize, hey, this is really what I love about this business. This is what I like. This is, yep. and it may not be the 10 people that say no, it might be the two that say, yeah, but that that's important because it builds that momentum. So, so Bruce, before people start to drop off, anybody that wants to get a custom sheet, if you're a solo agent or team leader, um, come on this same link. I'm not going to send you a reminder intentionally because if it's important to you, you'll remember it and write it down. 9 a.m. on Monday, I'll have Fred on here. I'll join by five after nine. We'll create a custom link for you where you can have uh, the basic questions uh, that you want to measure the activities, okay? And you can do it as a solo agent or you can do it as a team leader. I will, at my expense, create this form for you so that you can measure it. Then it's up to you to fill it out and measure your own performance and tell your team members that, you know, I care about you and in in, in order for me to ensure that you're going to have consistent success, I need to know what you're doing so that I can help you, right? It's not, I'm this greedy miser here that's looking to squeeze another sale out. It's like, I can't help you if I don't know what's going on and what's working. So Monday at nine, I'm not sending a reminder out. Only the hardcore people will show up and I'll provide you with the link. And I'm probably going to take everybody that I give the link to on Monday and I'm going to share with everybody else on that Monday morning meeting, who's actually doing the link. So I'm going to hold you accountable by exposing you to your peers. Okay. A little peer pressure. Um, and then lastly, Bruce, I want to wind this up with, you said that you have material about the core, right? I have core material and Mike Ferry material. If you, um, if you want that, um, show up on this link at nine o'clock on Monday. Um, I will uh, create those custom links. Bruce, if you can finish talking about the core, because I, I've seen some people who've uh, had dramatic results. They, they had to invest a lot of money to be part of it. Was that the, was that the premise the to core, it? The core is, the core is tricky. The core is like, do you remember that P90X where the guy was ripped like crazy or the gal was ripped like crazy, but you, you, and they say, oh, it's 90 minutes a day. I mean, look, if you do anything for two hours every day, you become an animal. So the core is really intense. But I do have some of that literature. I'd be more than happy to share with anybody. Um, ask your manager how to get in touch with me. It's, it's you know, uh, obviously I'm, I'm I'm available. But also I have some ferry stuff too, which for people that maybe are a little unclear on how to handle some objections, you know, it's stuff that if you've been to seminars, you have. But I literally have it in PDFs, you know, dealing with buyer objections, dealing with whatever. And it just kind of gives you a segue to get dialogue going. So anything I could provide to be helpful would be a pleasure. So, uh, and then maybe, maybe, uh, you know, Bruce, if they go to the uh, Medieval Times, they can give you their card and you'll get it out to them. And if you're in Florida and you want to uh, reach out to Fazia and Fazia will coordinate getting it from Bruce. Yeah, all your managers know how to reach me. So it's all cool. Whatever I could do, no worries. So, um, yeah, it, it's, I just feel like, I feel like I learned something today, Bruce, which was something that I knew, but I just committed it to paper, which is, Good markets create bad habits. What scares me, what I learned, and, and this is funny because Glenn's wildly successful by, by most standards, right? What blew me away was his team's only prospecting two hours a day, and he has that kind of success on just two hours. And one of the biggest things Mike Ferry always used to say to me when I when he coached with me, he coached with me as a lender, which was unusual for him. And he, he said, you have to do the most productive thing every day, 50% of the day. I'm like, well, that's freaking impossible. How are you going to do that? But that's how you scale. And he, I mean, again, two hours gets all those results from, from you know, from Glenn. I mean, it just shows you how few people prospect. It's crazy. I'm yeah. guilty of it too. We all are. Yeah. I, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I would say that, you know, the, the number of hours of real prospecting per week per agent, I'm going to guess it's probably, you know, seven and a half for our group and in the industry, maybe an hour and a half. Right. And and that hour and a half is not even consistent over a week. That hour and a half is maybe they freak out at one day and they make four hours of calls during the month, but it's not consistent. One of the biggest things I tell my gang, and we have, we actually just do it on a sheet of paper, but we're going to get on a thing. This was a core item. One of the things I tell my gang is that when you fill it out every day, don't, if you miss one day, so be it. You miss a day. It's an, it's an honest accountability tool. It's not, you know, we're all going to screw up. We're all going to miss someday until it becomes that habit. But just don't give up on it. Don't give up on doing it daily and weekly because it, you know, you may say, Jesus, I, I, I blew this thing off three days this week and I got two appointments. Well, gosh, can you imagine if you didn't blow it off those three days, how many appointments you'd have? That in itself, your failure to do it becomes a metric. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, but putting yourself out there, Bruce, and measuring yourself 
like the admin that I was interviewing to, to work for a team who had somebody who wasn't technologically inclined filled out that sheet and every week asked the VA to show him what his week looked like and compare it to the prior week and then run it for the month it just shows me the value of a top producer, even if you're not a team leader, understanding the accountability to hold himself accountable, right? We're all in our own business. I think, unfortunately, we forget that sometimes. It's, you know, regardless of who we work for, we're all in our own business. You know, nobody's paying us to be here. Yep. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to end my portion by just saying for like the umpteenth time, good markets create bad habits. Dynamic markets require good habits. And then if you have those good habits, you're going to do better because most people lost the discipline during the good times and there's an opportunity, right? So even, even lenders, Bruce, a lot of lenders in the industry are, are probably worse than realtors, right? Would you say that the lending industry has gotten hurt a little bit worse than real estate? Well, I think so. Cause it was easier for us. You know, one of the biggest knocks on that, you know, is real estate harder is mortgage lending harder. You know, we have refinancing. So obviously in my opinion, it's a little easier. It's not easier to be real successful, but it but it is easier for the average person because you know anybody that needs money, you could help. You don't have to find them a home. Half of them have a home, so I think it is easier. But yeah, there's a lot of people that get lazy. There's a lot of fruition in our business, and uh, but that fostered even more bad habits, right? Because you were absolutely, you, absolutely. you 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 were shooting fish in the bucket, right? And you were neglecting the relationships that kept you sustainable over time. Or well, I mean, we we. Unfortunately, I, I, my team and us, we've learned our lessons with that, but it, but not to no, not to lose those relationships, but it was still the activities were down. Right. And I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying it at you, but I'm saying like the industry, the industry, right. when, when, you know, rates drop, like and people refinance two or three times and you had a pipeline of business, those people weren't buying two or three houses. They were refinancing the same one. So you had this unique opportunity and if that opportunity made you feel like you were a genius and then you neglected to build new relationships, you're paying the price right now. Okay. And in, the industry is, no and, question. It, and in real estate, it was a little bit less of a uh, dramatic turn. Um, but I don't see the uh, real the um, lending community, Bruce, going into offices going to open houses like unsolicited as much as I did before the pandemic. And maybe they're saying to themselves, I'm not going to, into the real estate offices as much now because there's not as many people there, but it only takes one or two, right? Well, that's why I think it's all about contact. It's I call it green time. Any time you spend a phone with somebody that could lead to green for and, and in collaboration with a real estate professional, it's the realtor and yourself, you know, even if it's a phone call, but yeah, but to me, that's just, yeah, no, no, no. There's no question. Everybody's, uh, everybody's been off their game. And, and there was also agents where it was really easy for them too, because, you know, there was tons of buyers out there when rates were 2% and it was much tougher to get homes. I, I compliment the hell out of the way the real estate community figured that out, you know, to overbid and wave appraisals and come up with all these strategies, but it was easy because the buyers were everywhere. Now all the buyers are like, I'm not buying a house. So it's, you know, luckily there's some that have to, and uh, it's still a trillion dollar industry. So we, we just have to find them. Yep. Well, I, uh, I wish everybody a productive, great weekend. I I'm like, I can't tell you how pumped I am by just like saying how the good markets made these bad habits. And if we just recognize that that's the first step, right. To, to realizing that, you know, and, and substituting challenging with the word dynamic just gives me a more empowering motivation to help. Right. It's not optional. Dynamic markets require good habits. I was at an MBA thing in Philly, MBA thing in Philly, and we had a mastermind. And it was a group of folks that are all sitting there saying, everyone's like, oh, what do you think of the next five months? You know, what do you think things are going to be? And, and all these lenders are just in their heads down. And I, and again, maybe because of my excitement recently with all the activity of tracking. So it was gone. my point was that, yeah, it sucks, but here's the whole point. We have a great group and we're increasing our activity. So I actually see our business going up because quite frankly, for, for our group or for our industry, I mean, some people may say this isn't the case, but I don't think it'd get any worse. I mean, business is way off. Margins are way down. You have to increase activity. If you do, everybody else is going to have that, that that mindset where they can't and they can't get it. So I think it's the same in real estate too. A lot of agents, you know, I mean, there's, there's people that just don't want to do this stuff. So Bruce, people like us have been in the industry a long time. 2008, 9, 10, when the market 
collapsed, right? And they had the mortgage crisis. That felt absolutely miserable. But in reality, that was that was like the the best thing that could have happened to me. And I'm not even just saying that because before that, you know, I never rolled up my sleeves as much and, you know, got with the agents and said, how can I help? Right. And put myself in the positions that made me uncomfortable trying to solve problems. Right. So it gave me this unshakable confidence that, you know, if you're willing to do the right things, I can help you. And before that, I don't think I was as skilled because it was easy. All right. And we never learn from our successes. That may sound controversial, but we only learn from our failures and how we put the pieces back together. Right. If you've never, if you've never, uh, how many people do you know? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm only asking this to you, Bruce, because you're on the screen there, but how many people do you know that had success and never had a failure getting there? I think everybody's had failures getting to where they are. Right. Of course. I, I mean, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. I mean, Jeff Bezos would tell you that he's had so many failures, so many things that he's tried that don't work. Right. I was reading something about him recently about Musk that was saying they were literally one month away from closing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was I, that close, you know. <laughs> yes. if, you, if you read his book, it, it's very, I mean, there were several of those where, you know, payroll wasn't going to be made. And, you know, but for the, I guess, the grace of history, because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't be talking about him. But that funding came in like the day before everything would have hit the fan. But that's just that tenacity that, that we have and learning from our failures. So I know we're on overtime here. Um, Monday at nine, you know, I hope to see you there. Um, if not, you'll be the few that are really taking advantage of it. And, um, you know, you guys taught me something. You guys forced me to verbalize something today, which is going to be really valuable for me for years to come. Take care, everybody. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.